Have you heard of a little tiny company that's not in the Congo, not in Switzerland, but it's in the Amazon? That was clever, huh? I know you have. I just got a package from them today. And that is why I'm excited to learn more about how they work and how you can profit from them in your business. I have none other than the CEO and founder of Orca Pacific here, John Giorso, and he specializes in helping companies maximize sales and increase their visibility and profits with Amazon. I'm going to bring him up right after we thank our sponsor. Winning with Google in 2020? Of course you want to. I'd advise Google search, advertising, and YouTube specialist, Rosh Sillers. Download the free Winning with Google in 2020 guide at eainterviews.com forward slash Rosh Tips. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Giorso. John, how are you doing today? Hey, good, Mario. How are you? I'm feeling great. I'm excited to learn what you know because... I have not met many people that do what you do. So why don't you take us to the beginning? What inspired you to even start this? Yeah. Um, so I've been doing this about 12 years. Um, it was uh, originally a, a, a small kind of spinoff part of a family company that I pretty quickly turned into my own thing. Um, you know, I was really personally passionate about Amazon. I think, uh, you know, I've I've certainly made a lot of mistakes, uh, but one thing I've gotten right is is about a decade ago, I just saw that they were going to be one of the biggest companies on the planet, and I wanted to be doing something with them when that happened. So, um, you know, I've always been kind of an Amazon fanboy and then basically turned that into a business. What is the main thing you would say, if someone's coming to you, what is the main thing you would say you help them with? Um, so I guess the headline is we help maximize the revenue potential for a company on the Amazon platform. Uh, we do that in a number of different ways, but ultimately we don't just want to grow a business because we have a lot of clients that come to us and their business is already healthy and growing. We want to truly maximize the potential. So that's really why we exist. And you're, that's what I was getting at is the, you said you have various ways how you can do it. What are some of the ways that, what's like the first thing you look for, for helping someone or they should be looking for if they want to be maximized? Sure. So we're a full service agency with an exclusive focus on Amazon. So what that means is we have capabilities in every facet of the platform. Uh, so for us, it's going to be dependent on where that brand or company is in their life cycle on the platform. But a lot of the, the most common uh, elements that are really going to uh, help accelerate a business are uh, an advertising, robust advertising plan and execution, um, content and SEO, uh, what we call being retail ready, uh, which kind of encompasses all the things that need to happen before those other two things I just mentioned. So being in stock at the right price available to customers, which seems straightforward, but can actually be pretty tricky uh, to get 100% right. So those are some of the, the big buckets. When people are coming to you, you said a lot of them are already healthy companies and they don't really need to grow, but you want to maximize it. Are those the, all the areas you're looking at, or is there something that someone should pay attention to that might be, let's say, technical on one aspect, but also just common sense on the other? Yeah. I mean, literally, if I were to sort of put, you know, things in buckets, there's, we're doing hundreds of different things on a daily basis across our clients. Um, you know, Amazon comes out with a new program that a brand could participate in literally almost every week. Uh, there's some new beta, some new, you know, oftentimes way to spend money on this site. There's lots of ways to spend money that don't necessarily pan out. There's a few that, that oftentimes do, but that's also going to be different for every brand. So, um, you know, we tend to look for asymmetric returns and opportunities, those that aren't, um, as competitive. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity in the new, in the, the things that Amazon is newly launching that are in beta that aren't fully rolled out to the entire platform. Um, because you can get kind of a, a first mover advantage. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a, um, an oddball one, but one I'm thinking about a lot right now is actually live video on the platform. That's kind of a, a, a burgeoning um, new new initiative. Uh, obviously, you're a fan of, of live video, but you know, with the right product and the right presenter, it can be a great way to uh, to sell a product on the site. So, 
not going to work for every brand, but for the right brand with the right capabilities, uh, the right message, it can work. And again, there's hundreds of different marketing, merchandising, advertising opportunities uh, to help sell more product on the site. Now, if you're on there, like I am, I have uh, multiple books on there. Would you suggest live video for books or would you say it's more for a product demonstration? And does everyone have access to it right now or is it only because you've done so much they roll it out to you first? Um, not everyone has access to it. So it's invite only right now. It's actually gonna be more about the affinity of the brand. Um, I mean, some of it's gonna be relationship based, but a lot of it is just, you know, do they think this is a, a top selling brand, a top selling product that could be represented well in this program? Uh, I would say books, no, probably doesn't make sense. I mean, you really need a product that you can demo. Um, you know, something that would do well in QVC is probably gonna do well on Amazon Live Video. It's, it's frankly not, um, it's innovative in the sense that they're doing it on the platform, but the medium itself has, has been done for, for 30 years on television. Um, so, and you know, like I said, that's one of a million uh, different opportunities out there. Well, I think it's cool that they're bringing, bringing that stuff out there because everything's just going more and more online. I saw something the other day that, I don't know if it was Q3 or the shopping season or Q4 or whatever, but long story short, home goods on Amazon like trounced the top four competitors offline this past year with the, uh, and I was just like, th there's no competition. Yeah. As, the, far, the, as far as if you're online or off or Amazon and that, I mean, there's yeah. competition with on it now, but yeah. how have you seen that being affect your, your clients over the years? Yeah. I mean, Amazon is absolutely dominant in e-commerce. Uh, you know, you can talk about all of retail and they're obviously a big retailer in their own right, but they still have real competition when you factor in, you know, Walmart, Target, Costco, the other big brick and mortar retailers. But in e-commerce, I mean, I think they have like 60% share of, of all e-commerce. And in some categories, they have, you know, 80, 90% of e-commerce is just Amazon. Um, what's happened is it's, uh, it's created a, a dynamic where most brands have to be there. And because they have to be there, um, Amazon can uh, exert more pricing power, like any big retailer would. You know, when they have all the cards, they're gonna make the most of it. So um, it hasn't necessarily made it easy for brands, but I still think there's an opportunity to, to really partner with Amazon in a, a net positive way um, and, uh, you know, and ultimately win on the site. It's also created a dynamic because there's so much opportunity, there's just so much volume on the site that it's more competitive than it's ever been. I mean, there's, I think there's 500 million unique SKUs on the platform now. I mean, the number's just like almost silly. Um, uh, you could never even envision that many products, but it, it, it's created a dynamic where it's not just even US-based companies now. You have companies based overseas that are, you know, direct importing product that can come, get to market very fast, and very cheap. Um, so it's uh, more competitive than it's ever been. Uh, because there's so much opportunity. For someone who's not on Amazon yet, or is, but is just kind of kicking it with a stick, what are a couple of things you'd recommend to them? Yeah, so I, I'd say there, there's two kind of big buckets that you need to focus on. The first is the same stuff you'd have to focus on if you were selling a product anywhere. And those are the fundamentals of, you know, right price, right product, innovative, good brand, all of those things that you'd have to, you know, have for direct consumer or target or anyone else. But then in addition to that, you have to know how to, how to out Amazon the competition because you, know, you have to just assume everyone has a good quality product. Everyone has a good brand, everyone. That's not enough. You also have to be expert at the platform itself uh, in terms of the way it functions, how SEO works, how content works, how the advertising functionality should play into your overall strategy. So you have to have you have to be good at all the things you already had to be good at to be successful in this business. Plus you have to layer on top an Amazon expertise. And you know, what, what we see, obviously the agency guy saying, Hey, everyone should hire an agency is self-serving, but I, I wouldn't even say that. I'd say everyone needs an expert, whether that's someone in house or you hire an agency. I mean, there's lots of ways to approach that, but having it, having Amazon be part of somebody's job or kind of an afterthought, you're just not going to get the maximum benefit out of it. You may get some sales, your product may be there. It, it may not be a disaster, but 
uh, but you're you're never going to squeeze all the juice from it if you're not really really focused on it as an organization. Some great expert authority insights because I, I've learned a lot from uh, others I've had on the show that don't do what you do, but they do a lot more with Amazon than I ever thought was even possible. And sure. you had m mentioned something, and I saw it on your website too, uh, with the ads. A lot mm -hmm. of people don't even know you can advertise on Amazon. They think you just yeah. drop something on there one time and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's this is the single biggest change on the platform in the last three years. Amazon used to be a much more uh, organic, democratized platform. It was really about showing up, being in stock, you know, having good content, putting your best foot forward, but maybe doing some marketing, uh, which was always sort of vague in terms of the results or what you actually got out of it. Once Amazon instituted actual data-driven programmatic options from an advertising perspective and then took over a huge amount of real estate on the platform with paid placements, it really turned it into a pay-to-play platform. So today, uh, you know, if, if you type in any keyword on Amazon, probably five out of the first 10 results are going to be paid. So as a brand, if you're not taking that seriously and your competitors are, there's really nothing you can do to overcome. Like if you don't have the advertising piece handled and figured out on the platform, even if your product's better, frankly, even if it's lower price, it, it, that's not going to be enough. Your competitors are going to eat your lunch. Now, the flip side to that is there's a huge amount of upside opportunity because you now have this giant lever to pull to grow your business that didn't exist before. So it's incentivizing the more aggressive brands are doing even better than they used to. And the ones that are asleep at the wheel are not have, let me say, have more to lose. That's hilarious, but, but it's also true. And yep. it's just, even in the last 10 years, I mean, it's just amazing to see what the companies are doing. And if you really pay attention, they're all being very similar. And people could argue, well, now I have to pay to, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, all sure. these. Well, I used to be able, it doesn't matter. I get excited because it's like, all you have to do is pay them and you get yeah. access to the whole thing and the data. Yep. I'd rather yep. have to pay and get all the insights and the data and the SEO benefits than just, you know, have a large reach and 80% isn't the right people. Well, and keep in mind, it's an open platform. So if you're a new, you know, brand selling whatever product, you'd have to bang your head against a wall for four years to get into a Walmart or Target or Costco. You can go set your stuff up by the end of the day on Amazon. So yeah, there's, you know, you have, you have to pay to play to a degree, but they're also just handing you the keys and saying, this is your business. You can make it or break it or accelerate it. It's all up to you. So you know, compared to the old school brick and mortar retailers who all have multiple layers of gatekeepers and planning and all these things, it's, it's liberating. Uh, and my advice would be to take full advantage of that if you're a consumer product brand. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of them from the publishing side. Ever since I did my first book, I've helped people publish uh, lead generating and profit generating business books and help them market them. Yep. And before, like you're saying, how long would it take you to get into all the brick and mortar stores yeah. and all of this traditional publishing, this and that I do everything in eight weeks with people. Yeah. And yeah. there's no way you're going to do that. Uh, 15 years ago, 12. Yeah. No, I mean, cause well, and, and not to mention the big publishers, if you could even get a book deal and then get, you know, they have, you have to go through them to get distribution. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely Amazon is one of those companies that is making uh, creating more opportunity for entrepreneurs in this country than I think there's ever been. It's not just Amazon, you know, it's, it's a lot of the tech companies and other things, but the opportunities now to start and grow a business are so much more open and democratized than they used to be where you just had to know the right person or you had to already have capital or already have a brand. Um, I, I think that's why, frankly, one of the reasons you're seeing the economy do so well is because there's just so much opportunity to come in and, 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 you know, make something quickly. That's, that's exciting to me. And I'm glad you're on the cutting edge of it. And I appreciate you for sharing this with expert authority world. I want to ask you about your clients. Who, 
who are a couple of the biggest success stories? You have a lot of big names on your site. Um, yeah. If you can't talk about who they are specifically, I get it, but I'm sure there's some. Who are some of your biggest success stories? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I guess it depends on how you define success. I mean, if you look at it purely from a, a monetary standpoint, I mean, we have brands that we started with that were doing 20, 30, 50,000 a year on the site six years ago that are now doing 40 million. Um, so, you know, that's basically exponential. People misuse the term exponential growth, but it's literally exponential, you know, doubling every year um, for, for six, seven years. Um, but we have a lot of businesses that we've come into more recently who are already, you know, decently large, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million. Um, and we've really been able to accelerate the growth and to, uh, in some cases, just create more efficiency and more profitability. You know, Amazon, it's, it's, if it's not approached the right way, it's very easy to just throw a ton of money at the platform and not necessarily get the results that you're looking for. So, you know, there, there are some brands that actually can be kind of over investing, overspending, or just investing maybe in, in, in a suboptimal way. Um, and so there's, there's oftentimes big opportunities there as well. Um, so. What have you noticed any similarities with the ones that started smaller versus they were already underway? Do they both have yes. the same type of problems or are they completely different? Well, you know, what's interesting is, is we do solve problems. I mean, we come in and fix things. Sometimes things are on fire and we have to put out the fire, but a lot of the time it's not necessarily there's a problem. It's just that the opportunity hasn't been fully leveraged. So it's not that anything's broken. It just hasn't been fully maximized. You know, I would say that the, the common thread for the brands that we work with who've done disproportionately well is that one, they have a commitment to Amazon and to the platform. They take it seriously. They put in the right investment. They pay attention to it. They make changes in their own business if they have to, to make the Amazon business work better. And then two, they're flexible from a test and learn perspective. Amazon, like I said, comes out with you know, a different beta program every week. So the brands that have been willing to uh, invest, not make huge bets, not bet the farm, but make small bets, a lot of small bets on a lot of these new things with, with no guaranteed payoff, some don't work, some work really well, and then you can double down on those. Those brands that are willing to be nimble, which by the way, is a lot easier for entrepreneurial, you know, small uh, privately run companies versus like big CPG companies, a lot, lot tougher when you have a big bureaucracy you're dealing with. But regardless, um, that flexibility, willing to kind of test is, has been really helpful over the long run for, for the brands that take it seriously. What do you see on the horizon for the next five to 10 years with Amazon? Uh, it's gonna, it's gonna be wild. Um, I, I think, uh, so the, the one thing that I always, I think people are, uh, uh, maybe think I'm wearing a tinfoil hat a little bit, but, uh, I, I think the Alexa platform is going to end up being absolutely game changing. Uh, right now it's, it's kind of a gimmicky, you know, voice activated speaker that people have. Um, but what we're looking at is essentially a preview into the future. Uh, so I think that, Alexa uh, will fundamentally alter the way that we do commerce and a lot of our personal computing uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, I think a good percentage of people's purchases on Amazon 10 years out, five years out, especially 10 years out, will not involve any actual effort. They will be essentially reordered, automatically ordered, or maybe at worst, um, from an effort perspective ordered with a very quick, uh, voice command. Uh, and that's really going to change the entire dynamic of the platform. It's not going to happen overnight, but I do think we'll continue to see iterative, uh, progress towards that. I think you were kind of right on target because, uh, there's videos I've watched on YouTube where they're talking about, I don't want to say it because she can hear me right now. Yeah. And that's why I'm glad I had my uh, in-ear monitors in when you, you kept saying it. I was like, she can't hear you. But, gonna, um, yeah. While I was watching those, 
stuff was actually getting ordered and I was like, oh my gosh, wh like wh whatever the keywords that were spoken, it wasn't just like, look this up. It was like add to cart and purchase. I don't yeah. even know what it was, but yeah. when I looked, I got the emails that were like, it was already through and I was, I was like, I was watching a YouTube video and it was still picking it up. Yeah. 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 I, uh, I ordered a toaster the other day, which is, you know, it's one thing if you reorder the same coffee that you've ordered for two years, that's pretty straightforward, but you know, a toaster, you need to see it. You need to consider it. You know, is it four slice, two slice, is it Chrome, is it black? And part of the reason I was able to do that is I was using the device with a screen on it. Uh, the, the new, I think it's the show eight. Um, so I, you know, there's, again, that's, I think a look into where this is all going, but if you can buy a toaster, you can buy most products then through the platform. What do you think about the uh, Amazon auto? Yeah, I, I think it's cool. So I think it's a piece of where this is all going, which is for this to truly function the way that they want it to function. It has to be, it has to be with you essentially 24 hours a day. So it's already in your house for people that have a device, right? Maybe it's one part of your house. Maybe it's just the kitchen, just your living room. Um, but they want it to be throughout your entire house. They want it to be in your car, which a lot of people spend a lot of time in their cars. And then it needs to be on your person. So when you looked at the new round of devices they launched, there were a lot of wearables that are very, uh, I would say, like, I'll say gimmicky right now. I think they're pretty gimmicky. I don't know how much really functionality you're going to get out of it. But again, it's kind of version one. Uh, ultimately, I think Amazon's realized they're never going to own the smartphone because there's massive entrenched uh, competitors that don't want them to, but they can own the rest of the wearable environment as well as the car and the home and the workplace. And if you do that, you have a personal assistant that lives with you 24 hours a day. And if you have that, it means that all of your commerce now, just like when, when people started switching from, okay, I need something, I have to figure out what store to go to versus their default behaviors, I'm just going to go on Amazon first. I think we're ultimately going to get to a place where the first thing I think of is I'm going to ask, uh, and I'll just say the, the voice assistant, so I don't trigger it, but I'm going to ask the voice assistant first, I'm not going to jump on my phone or my computer. And once we get to that point, they've changed the way that people fundamentally shop and, and purchase products. And I think they will get there. It's interesting you're saying that. And it's also funny because I, the other thought I had was, I wonder how many people are getting triggered watching this episode or listening to it. Yeah. Like I should probably do like I a, was watching like another a one. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. But when you said they won't own the smartphone space, I was thinking they don't need to because there's a lot of people pushing to get rid of the physical device, yeah. but still have the functionality. I've seen, you know, the foldable phones, the hologram phones where it's projecting on your arm, this and that. And it's like, I remember when someone proposed that a couple of years ago and it's like, oh, you know, it's, it's going to be a thing of the past. And I'm like, what do you look at then? Yeah. Yeah, I, I th you know, that's still a big question mark when you think about future state technology stuff. Google tried to do it with Google Glass. I think they were probably way too early. You know, right now you have the Apple Watch. Amazon just came out with a ring, with literally a ring, like you wear on your finger with a speaker and microphone in it, which is pretty wild. Um, glasses and then earbuds that all have, uh, you know, the assistant um, integrated. I, I don't know, there's no way that could replace a smartphone right now, but potentially in this, you know, kind of conversational AI, the AI knows everything about you and your calendar and all these other things. Could you get away with not carrying around a phone? Yeah, I think potentially, which is, I mean, pretty wild actually, if we get to that place. So. Yeah. And for me, I, I like to do a fair amount of research and look stuff up and just be educated and learn. Yep. But there's also, a, I know a fair amount of people who are just listening to stuff, watching stuff. It's more of an entertainment, check an email, check a text. And if you look at the basic operations, most people aren't sitting at computers anymore, nine to five, yeah. using them just to check email. Because yeah. even four years ago, you know, some of my own students were like, you know, they were just struggling with something. I was like, are you on your desktop or laptop? They're like, I haven't used one in two years. And I'm like, 
well, no wonder everything's more difficult. You're trying to pull office work off on a screen 24 seven. And it's like, at some point you need a bigger screen. Yeah. But I if agree. you don't do that type of work. Yeah. You. Yeah. That's why I think for personal computing, it makes the biggest impact for work. I mean, I still need a, you know, as, as advanced as we are, I still need a big screen and a keyboard and a mouse. So at least one screen. At yes. Least one, at least big, one screen. Yep. So how are you wrapping this in with your clients and are any of them asking you, well, can you get me on her? Can you do this? Can you do that? Or yeah. is it pretty straightforward with the process that you're taking them through as far as it, it's a similar process for everyone. You don't need to change that, but you might change what you're doing within it per, per, per different client. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting is like this stuff's super fun to talk about uh, because it's the future and it's going to be really interesting to see where it goes. From an actual practical brand perspective, I want to sell more product on Amazon next month. There, there are some things that you can do to integrate better with the platform, with the voice platform. Um, for CPG brands, so for consumable brands, there's more to do right now because there's more purchases of consumable product happening through a voice only environment. Because obviously, if you have voice only, which most people still don't have a screen yet associated with it, it's really hard to order a toaster or a jacket or a pair of shoes. You can say reorder a coffee, reorder laundry detergent. Um, so, uh, so there are some things to do. Um, you know, getting customers to engage with the platform, encouraging them to engage with the platform offline, so off Amazon, uh, to say. Um, you know, and I won't say it, but, uh, uh, the wake word add to my cart, those types of things are very simple, but that type of messaging can get customers into the habit of using it to replenish product. And, and that can help. Um, there are some things that can be done to optimize product detail pages, uh, for the, the current sort of voice experience, but think of it right now, similar to the shift from desktop to mobile you weren't going to fundamentally throw out your strategy and say, well, people are going to mobile. We need to do things entirely differently. You are probably going to take everything you'd been doing that was successful and just tweak it so that it shows up the right way. You know, people interact with it the right way on mobile, which by the way, we're still going through that today. Now you just have to layer on kind of this next evolution of, you know, desktop to mobile, mobile to voice, um, which I do think will be, really impactful long-term, but right now, I think it's more about being educated on where this is all going and then being prepared to act quickly uh, when it does eventually start to make a serious impact on actual purchasing behavior and, and commerce. Um, there are some custom opportunities with that team, but frankly, like you need to be a big high affinity brand to, you know, this is, this is kind of big global uh, partnership stuff. So, um, but I, but I assume, you know, over time, uh, Amazon will open up more and more opportunities to proactively play, uh, in the voice platform, uh, from a brand perspective. So whether it's three, five, eight years, 10 down the road, how long do you think it will take? Um, you know, I'm thinking of S curves and economics, critical mass. How long do you think it will take to just completely go from where it's at to everyone's got that uh, consumption rate, everyone's adopted it, and it's the new way of doing things. Yeah, so it's, what's interesting is, um, I don't have the, the stats in front of me, but if you look at the adoption of the devices, um, Echo devices have been adopted faster than any other big technological shift, much faster than smartphones, way even more, even faster than, uh, PCs were adopted, you know, 20, however many, 20, 25 years ago. So they basically went from nothing to like, I think their penetration is like 40, 50% of US households have one now in like three years. So the, the adoption of the technology itself is pretty much there to hit scale. It's actually the functionality of the platform still needs to improve. Um, the devices are used frequently, but not for very long. So, you know, maybe someone uses it to uh, listen to the news in the morning, set a few timers in the evening when they're cooking, maybe look up a recipe, but you know, total like 10 minutes of usage per day. A lot of people use it even less. So 
there needs the, there's really a lot of improvement, frankly, uh, in the technology itself, which Amazon has, I think uh, they have thousands of people, just engineers on the team. So it's a, it's a huge investment for them improving this, but there are some real improvements that need to happen. You need to get to a point where the AI is much more conversational versus this kind of clunky back and forth conversation. Uh, you know, you need to feel like you're talking to a human. Um, there needs to be a lot more integration with things like calendars and other you know, parts of your life that ultimately impact different uh, behavior. Uh, you need to get a lot more connectivity. Like again, it can't just be the one device in the kitchen because that's limited. You need to have it in the car and on the person, but they're working on all these things. I, I would say we start to see a fundamental shift in consumer behavior in two to three years. So that would be my two to my three guess. years one, once it's adopted. Well, I would say it is adopted. I mean, I think there needs to be more penetration. So you're but saying I mean, all this in, in the next two to three years? Yeah, I would say in two to three years, you start to see the way people go about their lives from, from a computing perspective starts to fundamentally change. Doesn't radically overnight shift, but you start to see real changes now in behavior terms of the way people actually get things done, schedule appointments, book dinner reservations, buy stuff, uh, communicate with people. Yeah, I think I think that happens as soon as two to three years from now. Well, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. What do you see it doing for travel and international? So, I mean, I think for travel, I mean, I, I always think about it in this paradigm of personal assistant. So if I have a personal assistant, one of the first things I'm gonna have them do is, is book my travel, book dinner reservations, book movie tickets, that kind of stuff. So I actually think that's where it, it all, there's already a lot of functionality built out. It's still a little bit nerdy in the sense that you have to like set it up and activate it and go, you know, you still have to be kind of a fanboy of it to really use it. It's not, it's not going to be used by your average consumer who just wants the thing to work. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's hugely applicable for travel companies, the Expedias of the world to have skills that plug into the platform. Uh, and then, you know, you can just book through that versus having to actually go on a screen uh, and book things. Uh, or again, maybe both depending on the device. But yeah, I think, I think very applicable. And then in terms of international penetration, I think the platform's trained on like 15 languages now. Um, you know, I mean, their, their goal is going to be to have every language where there's an Amazon operation is, you know, synced up with so well i appreciate everything you're sharing you've given a lot of great insights i am curious i know there's someone that's listening to this that's maybe not utilizing amazon they're not selling a whole lot but like we're talking about with the alexa skills oh crap oh, we're good <laughs> um just the different stuff we're mentioning, it's no longer just a place to, you know, and I'm thinking for myself, it's no longer a place to only sell books. What are a couple of ways they can take advantage of it, regardless of what business they're in? Do you yeah, think so, you're setting up a skill or a news briefing in, uh, in the morning? I would say the juice is not worth the squeeze for most companies right now. If you're a large consumer service or consumer product company, it's worth looking at, especially consumer service company, to be honest. I mean, I actually think um, uh, a company selling movie tickets is going to get more out of it than a company selling toasters right now, even though you don't sell movie tickets on Amazon. Um, but I think that's worth looking at. Skills are, you know, you need an engineering team or someone that's very tech savvy uh, to do. So it's, it's going to be a six-figure investment, most likely. So... I don't think that's the place to start. I think if you're a brand that is on Amazon and you want to really maximize the potential, and this is going in the total opposite direction of the conversation so far, but honestly, I think you need to focus on the fundamentals. You need to make sure you have great content. Uh, it's SEO optimized. You need to make sure that your advertising budget is appropriate and being uh, efficiently spent or maximize the the opportunity of those dollars you need to make sure your products in stock that has good reviews once you've done all those things that should lead to a significant uptick in growth now after that then you should get into things like 
uh, voice and live video and some of the other opportunities on the platform. But I do, I do get worried as, as interesting and exciting as some of these things are to talk about, you know, you risk kind of the, the shiny ball syndrome where you're always going, Oh, this cool new thing, this cool new thing, you know, you're, you're kind of chasing these things around while, while the fundamentals of the business aren't, aren't maximized. So it's not nearly as exciting to talk about, but some of those fundamental elements are still going to be the day-to-day -day drivers. Well, having a healthy business is a healthy, profitable, long-term business. That's exciting to talk about. True. Yeah, that is true for sure. And I, I know, like you're saying, the SEO, the reviews, I, I've told people about reviews for forever because no matter if it's just a testimonial uh, or a book review or whatever, if you don't have those, that's the social proof that everyone's looking at. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Reviews are critical. High quality content's critical. High quality images. Um, uh, you know, Amazon offers a lot more opportunity for brands than they used to, to put rich media on the platform. So you still have to go do it all or have an agency do it all. You know, they're not going to do it for you, but at least the structure is there to be able to tell your story as a brand before, you know, four or five years ago, it was much, much more limited, but you have things like a brand store now, which is kind of like a little website within the site that just is about your brand. Um, you have an opportunity to do 360 imagery, uh, a lot more video capabilities, um, embedded video in the actual uh, detail page. So while you're scrolling through content, you can see a video. There's advertising capabilities, video and search. So as you're scrolling on a mobile device through search results, you can have a little 15 second video pop up, showcase your product that converts really, really well. So there's a lot of like cool stuff that you can do now to really put your best foot forward as a brand. And I'm excited to tell you, I know you said it might not be applicable to everyone, but since you have your show, there's a fair amount you can do uh, with a podcast and uh, her uh, f to get people, they just change something around where you can just, it's already programmed and you don't need to do a lot of engineers in that. They're rolling out more and more specifically because it's, it's, it's all audio and voice. Yep. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, I have one other question for you, and I call this, I just released it on the last episode. It's going to eventually be yellow and blue, uh, no, yellow and whatever that is, black. Um, call it the wheel of whatever. We spin it, and we're going to pretend the questions are on there right now, but you gave me, I have some standard ones, but the one I have for you is with everything we're talking about with AI and tech and Alexa, her and all these different things. What do you think they're doing with the data? Do you really think it's a big brother thing that everyone thinks there's this big conspiracy about it? Or do you really think it's private and no one's ever heard of anything but Amazon? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's private. Like they're not gonna, you know, like any company, they will use data sets to, to do ad targeting, like, like Facebook or Instagram or Google or, anyone's, everyone's doing that, right? Walmart's doing it now. Um, everyone's using their kind of core data set about how old you are and where you live and what you like to purchase to serve relevant ads. I think that's pretty, you know, kind of, uh, I, to me, I see that as very non-controversial. I don't care if someone says, oh, you like this soap, we're gonna show you a picture of a similar soap. Okay, fine. Um, any of the other stuff is really, kind of conspiracy theory stuff. I mean, Amazon's been actually very transparent about what they do when they record you with the devices. When they do record you, they use that to improve the algorithm, but they're not doing anything else with that information. Um, so yeah, most of it's kind of conspiracy theory stuff. I'm not, I'm not frankly real worried about it. Okay, that's fair. I was just curious because we're, we're talking about all the things and I, I go, I know there's someone that's like thinking of the picture of, you know, I, I walked into my home and I said this and, you know, the machine laughed, the toaster laughed, the refrigerator laughed. We all had a good time. And yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think it's, it's important to be cognizant enough to understand what is and isn't happening just from a consumer standpoint, but you know, Amazon's not going to risk violating trust with their customers. That's, that really is. I mean, that's a, 
hundred billion dollar mistake for them if, if they did that. So they're just they're going to put the customer first. They're going to they're going to act ethically. I, I mean, maybe people say, oh, God, you're just, you know, uh, you're like an Amazon spokesperson. But I've been working with the company for a decade. And honestly, I've never seen them do anything that that they don't think is ultimately in the best interest of the customer. So. And that's why I asked you and saved the other ones for the next interviews, because I was like, he's going to know if anyone's going to know it's going to be you. And I didn't think so. But, you know, you hear people say stuff and everything. And I, I've told people for years, too, even when Facebook came out, they're like, oh, they're going to uh, whatever. I go, you have to remember, you're the one volunteering the information. If you don't want someone to know, stop posting it so much. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And, know and where I'm, I'm at, stop checking in. It's not rocket science. Yeah, for sure. And on Facebook, you know, you're not the customer, you're the product. You're not paying anything. Their customers are their advertisers. You're the product. On Amazon, you're actually the customer. So. Wow. I think we have a whole other talk there, but uh, we're going to thank our sponsor and come back for the imperfect action round. Winning with Google in 2020? Of course you want to. I'd advise Google search, advertising, and YouTube specialist, Rosh Sillers. Download the free Winning with Google in 2020 guide at eainterviews.com forward slash Rosh Tips. All right, we are back with the imperfect action round. John, are you ready to take imperfect action? Sure. First question. What is the fastest path to the cash? Um, always add value. Excellent. Number two. What is the biggest problem you see your prospects making in the fastest way they can fix it? Um, I see them not taking a long-term view of the platform. So they're too short-term transactional focus. They need to be thinking two, three, five years out. Number three, what's the best way to maximize customer lifetime value? Honestly, same answer, but I'll expand a little bit from the first question. I think, especially from an agency perspective, you have to be obsessed with adding value to your client every day, every hour, every week. If you're not, they have plenty of options. They have plenty of other ways to go about doing this. You need to add maximum value uh, to the point where you're completely indispensable uh, for their business. Very good. What are some books that have made a big difference in your life? Um, yeah, a couple. Well, I mean, I read a lot, but a, a couple top ones. Honestly, it, it's it's at this point, it's like retro, but The 4-Hour Workweek was one of the first books I ever read on, on, well, not first, but it was one of the most impactful books I ever read on business. Cheesy title, uh, really great book, though, about time management. And when you're an entrepreneur, it's much more about choosing what not to do than it is about what you can do or should be doing. So, um, so that's a really interesting book. It kind of makes you rethink your, your entire uh, way of approaching your day and what you're going to spend time on, what's important and what's not. That's a great recommendation. Any others? Um, yeah, I read a book. Uh, gosh, I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, author. Yeah. Drawing a blank. Uh, yeah, I, I, man, I read a lot. It kind of blurs together sometimes. Um, but I'm trying to think about the last book I, I read that I really liked. I just read a book called team of teams. I reread it. I, I think I read it a, a few years ago when it came out. Uh, I think it's Stanley McChrystal. He was a four-star general. Uh, ran the special operations command. Uh, and basically when we were losing really badly uh, in like 2004 in Iraq, uh, came in and kind of uh, reworked the whole structure of, of special operations. Uh, and a lot of those lessons are highly applicable um, to business, uh, especially in a, in a, with you know, their enemy was very fast moving, uh, very nimble uh, uh, enemy in, in, in Al Qaeda. And they were basically losing against them. And so it's, there's a lot of parallels between, you know, how to compete in a very fast moving environment from a business perspective, from a structure perspective. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting book. And what's the name of that one again? Team of Teams. Team of Teams. 
Yep. Excellent. Well, I appreciate appreciate the recommendations. I have thank I want to thank you for everything you have shared. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've got a lot out of it myself. Where can people learn more about you? Yeah, so we put out a lot of uh, thought leadership and different content on our website. So that's orca pack o r c a p a c dot com. Uh, and then I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Post a lot of different stuff and ideas, and try to be pretty engaged there. So you can just you know find me. Happy to connect uh, on that platform as well. Very good. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I want to thank you again. All right. Thanks so much. All right, Expert Authority World, we have another great episode. I look forward to seeing you on tomorrow's. Have a great day, and God bless.